from the Mecca Mormonism, Salt Lake City, Utah. This is Heart of the Matter Long. I'm your host, Sean McCraney. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we uh, thank you and love you, seek you and need you. Uh, pray that your spirit will be with us in abundance, that we will reflect a life in you and you in us as we walk about and sojourn through these uh experiences and, and, and circumstances that you've given us. Help us to be your sons and daughters by faith, with love, through love for all. We pray for Mags as she gets this uh, ready for people and people who tune in and are seeking for truth. And we pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Remember, email us with your uh, first and last name and the state or country in which you live so that we can put you on our list as we are going to be making some major changes coming up. The name of this show is Finally, I Understand. Um, it is one of the most important shows in terms of uh, a perspective that I now see as concrete. And it's eluded me for, for years. And that happens with us, doesn't it? That something will come in and percolate and germinate and spin around and we turn it up and we think about it and it comes and goes. We don't really understand it and it just continues to be in there. And then at one point, the spirit... Uh, uh, comes forward and it starts to all come together. And that's what I'm going to bring to you now. And I hope it's of worth. Paul said something in Romans one that has perplexed me as a believer. You may not think anything of it, but to me, it's always perplexed me. He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of of God to salvation for everyone who believes to the Jew first and also for the Greek. Maybe you are like me and you find yourself tripped up by certain words and phrases that pop out of scripture. And I've always wondered why Paul says that the gospel, not Jesus. Now I, I know all how they're connected, but he says the gospel or the good news is the power of God to salvation. And uh, why didn't he say Jesus Christ, the power of God to salvation? But instead, the gospel, the good news, is the power of God to salvation. Are they separate? Are they the same? Are they synonymous? Why the distinction? I always, I always do that. I, I try to say, why the distinction? Is it important? Is it necessary? Or is he just saying the same thing in a different way? Um, of course, Jesus is Lord and Savior and King and God with us. But what is the gospel? How is it different from him as a whole? If, Je if Paul said, for Jesus is the power of God to salvation then you'd have to think of all of Jesus, right? But Paul doesn't want us to think of everything about Jesus. He doesn't necessarily want us to think of him in the temple teaching the, uh, the high priests or, or the elders when he was 12 and, and, and all the things. Uh, he doesn't include a lot of things. He, he, Paul t describes the gospel as only three events out of Jesus' life. And he says that those three events combined are the power of God to salvation. So I started mulling over the term gospel, the gospel. And I looked at some different ways that used. Mark is unique in, in his use of it. We read Mark 1.15 where Jesus is uh, purported to say, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Okay, repent and believe the good news. This was before Jesus had fulfilled the, the events of the gospel. And also in Mark, Jesus appears to distinguish between himself and the gospel when he says, For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. It's interesting, Jesus himself said, and he, if you lose your life for my sake and the gospel's sake. And then in Mark 16, 15, we read, and he said unto them, go you into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Preach 
the specific things of the gospel. Why? What is it about this gospel that's the power of God to salvation? Now, uh, Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 succinctly describes the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it contains three components or events from his life. So no Jesus, no gospel, obviously. And the three things he says is that he died, according to scripture, that he was buried. Isn't that funny that he would say he died and he was buried and that he was raised on the third day, according to scripture? That's the gospel. And again, Paul says it's the power of God to salvation. We know that the power of God to salvation says nothing about baptisms. We note that the power of God to salvation says nothing about the doctrines on hell or sola scriptura or trinity or or anything else. All, again, that Paul uses to describe the gospel are three events in Jesus' life. He died. He was buried, which is almost synonymous with dying, isn't it? Why that sort of almost a redundancy there and that he rose again on the third day. It's really quite interesting. And so it's so interesting and not easily understood that it's, I've mulled about it for a couple decades. So these three acts or events from the man's life are the power. The power of God to salvation is not in his teachings. Now they contribute to things. It's not in the miracles. It's not in the healings. It's not in the virgin birth. Paul doesn't mention those things. Do you notice that? The power of God is not in his incarnation, even though we couldn't have the gospel without his incarnation. So you could assume that. You can do a lot of that, but Paul only mentions the three things. And he says it's the power of God to salvation. His power for salvation of human beings is in those three things. Always those three things. Now we know that those three things together could and would only be efficacious in and through Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, born of a woman, born of the flesh, born under the law. So the gospel is always and only provided and done by and through him. Nevertheless, the good news, the very power of God to salvation is only in the fact that he died. He was buried and he rose again on the third day. So I'm about to share what knocked me off my feet this past week for the first time in 45 years of study. Ready? Let's now look at how the gospel is the very power of God to salvation and why Paul designated the gospel in those three points. And let's start with the first point, that Jesus died. All right? So ask yourself, why did Jesus die? Specifically because, as 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He, God, has made Him, Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin. Now listen, and then add Romans 6.23 that says, The wages of sin is death. So we have Jesus who knew no sin, And we have him becoming sin for us, sin represented by the springing forth of fingers. And the wages of sin is death. That's why Jesus died. The wages, the payment for sin is death. He had no sin, but he died. Why? Because he took on our sin. Whose sin? Believers sin only? No. The sins of the world. He took on the sins of the world. Plenty of scriptures to support that, right? And because he did that, he died. First part of the gospel. Here's the marvelous thing about just his death alone. 
It was paying the wages for the sins of the world. And because he paid the wages for the sins of the world, God has been reconciled to the world. The gospel is the power of God to salvation. The first point is Jesus died. Who did he die for? The world. Why? The world's sin. Because he was made sin for us. And the wages of sin is death. So Jesus died for the world. Listen to 2 Corinthians 5, 18, 19. Listen closely. It's so important. And all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation, talking about himself as an apostle. Now listen, meaning, in other words, Paul says, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has uh, committed to us the word of reconciliation. When Paul writes that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself through Christ, the word is cosmos. It means the heavens and the earth through Christ. Then Paul writes something even more astounding at 2 Corinthians 5.14 and says, and because one... Jesus died for all, okay, then all are dead. Did you know what he's saying? That in and through Jesus' death, it's only the death we're talking about here, which was done because he was made sin, the wages of sin is death, the world died. The world died. Or as Paul says, because one died for all, then all are dead. Dead. The wage for sin is death. Jesus paid it, who had no sin. So the world died vicariously through him for that. The payment was paid by him for the sins of the world, past, present, and future. This is the first point of the great news. First point. Bottom line, through the first of three points that make up the gospel, which is the power of God to salvation, the entire world population had their debt paid for their sins that it has and will commit because Jesus was made sin for all, and in and from this, the wages of sin, which is death, was paid for by him for all. Now listen closely. If or since Christ died for the sins of all, God's wrath was propitiated. He how could God be angry for sin that has been paid for through the life of his son? And so while this is not salvation, or uh, uh, we do preach and teach in harmony with scripture, the universal reconciliation of all because of Christ's death. That's the first point of the good news. Believer and not, okay? Believer or not, reconciled to God because he died. That's the first point. That's good news. I'm asked to speak at funerals all the time for different people who are not believers. It's such good news. God's not angry at them because Jesus died, being sin for them. So, the first point of the gospel that Jesus died has direct good news application to the whole world. He died for their sin and God is appeased, but Paul does not stop there with just the death. 
It's not just about God's uh, salvation plan is not just based on his death. His death was for the reconciliation and the payment of sin for the world. But instead, he mentions something that is sort of strange. And he says he was buried. Right? Now, when, you're, when you die, you're buried. So why does Paul mention his burial as part of this good news? Why are we happy or pleased that his body was buried? What does that have to do with the, this being the power of God to salvation? Well, let's look at it. First, it was prophesied that the Messiah would be buried, specifically with the rich, as we read in Isaiah 53, 9, and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence, neither was there deceit in his mouth. So there's that. It was prophesied. And so according to scripture, Paul is showing this was him. This was he. Secondly, burial is really an important thing for Jews. It's sort of interesting, the term buried or burial is referenced over a hundred times in scripture. And it was at least a cultural event that a Jew could relate to when he reads that Jesus died and was buried because burial was so important. Then there's the symbolism of a believer who, a believer now, first his death is for believer and non. But when those people who believe on his death now look to his burial, the believer has the symbolism that goes with an outward dedication for an inward faith through water baptism. That they were died and they too, with Christ, were buried under the water. That's the symbolism of the act of baptism by immersion. And we'll talk about that in a moment, but I want to bring another element to the table relative to the reason Christ's burial is sort of almost redundantly part of the gospel. And it has application only to a certain type of believer. Remember, the gospel is the power of God into salvation. So he died, that's for everybody. The burial has only a application in the life of a certain kind of believer. Someone, let me try to explain that. Someone cannot believe that Jesus died for their sin. Um, that is okay because his death was for all. But someone who does believe that Jesus died for their sin might not be willing to let their sinful flesh die too. And instead of getting rid of that former man, they are just people who say, I know Jesus died for my sin, and they live as if they're... They, they are still the same person. Their body of sin is never buried. They are Christians who go forth and live by their flesh. They claim a belief in Jesus' death for them, but it has no application to their former person dying. So they remain unburied. Christ's body was put to death and buried. Buried how? Well, when you're buried, you're placed out of sight. You're, you're absent from people's view. And that's the same picture that we get when we are Christians in and through Christ, believing on him that he died. We too are buried to our former person and all that they were. And we are down in the grave dead. Our corpse isn't propped up in the house, right? The corpse doesn't continue to live, but for some Christians, it does. Their faith is just, I believe in Jesus, and they don't change in any way, shape, or form. Their former woman is still in full operation. All right. So the power of God to salvation, 
for believers begins with the fact that Jesus died for their sin. They look to that and believe that. And then the gospel is the power of God to salvation when they, the power of God to salvation, when they let the former person die and be buried from out of sight. People who would sit with me and talk with me, uh, who knew me when I was a teenager and in my 20s, they'd say, you're a very different person now. If they watched what I'm about and what I do and how I see the world and, and things, they would say, you're not the same guy. If I was the same guy, I would be somebody who was never buried. All right. And that's the symbolism of the burial as part of the gospel being the power of God to salvation. In other words, such a believer would not walk in the ways of their former flesh. They will, like Christ, allow that sinful man or woman, their former man, to be buried. This is the second way the gospel is the power of God to salvation. He died for sin, and that body that became sin for us was buried, hidden, put out of the way in a tomb. Um, and so the question is, are you as a Christian, through the power of God, uh, uh, that is the gospel, allowing your former person to be buried? What elements of the former woman or former man are you allowing to rise up out of the grave or never go into the grave and live? Right? That's what this is all about. It's all in and through his de uh, death, burial, and resurrection. Where did Sean McCraney from Huntington Beach go who was so rude and vile and violent and, and, and egocentric? And, and uh, I haven't seen that guy in years. Every now and then he might try to pop up, but yeah, that guy, not in years. Oh, that's because he died and was buried. He disappeared, right? That's what this means. That's the power of God to salvation for those who believe. Those who don't, they're never buried. Christ died for them and they just keep living their life. They just say, yeah, you know, he, di he died or he didn't die. I don't care, but he did it for the world. But those who believe on him now, they are buried with him. Ooh, we're getting a little deeper here. God is expecting some result of his son's death in the life of those who believe. In response to their belief in his death, they too allow their formerly fleshly body to be buried. It's really important to see the process, okay? Now, a believer does not have to bury their former man or woman. They can just let that flesh roam around and do what it has always done. Did Jesus pay for their sins? Absolutely, he paid for the sins of the world. Are they reconciled to God by that death alone? Absolutely, they're reconciled to God. He's not angry at them for their choices. They're choosing to do that. His son paid for them. That's it. But are they allowing the gospel, which is the power of God to salvation, to give them new life, to operate in them? No, they're not. And so their faith is weak and it doesn't lend to what God ultimately wants, which is the third point. That's rising to new life. It's not just laying in the grave as the former man dead. It's rising to new life. Naturally, the third and final part of the gospel as the power of God to salvation can only occur if a person has died. If a person former man or woman has been buried Th then only can they rise to new life right so um, and that is to rise from the grave in which you were buried your former person and you rise to that life by the same power by which God brought Jesus from the grave now we have a operating picture of the gospel, death, burial, resurrection, being applicable to every single person as the power of God to salvation. Notice that. It's to salvation. See? And that's the, that's the tricky part, is that it is, yeah, faith is important. 
Yes, saying I believe is important. But the power of God to salvation is seen in the literal death, burial, and resurrection of his son, imputed to other people who too die to their former man. That body is buried, disappears from this earth, and they rise to new life by the power that God rose, uh, raised Jesus by. And again, this event is optional for people who believe. There are those who believe in Jesus' death for sin, but whose former man or woman is never buried. And if it's never buried, it can never be raised. There are those who believe in Jesus' death and sin and their former flesh is buried, but it stays in the grave. They don't sin like they used to, but they don't do any of the works of love that God wants to and bear the fruit of his spirit in their lives. They don't rise. You can stay at any place you want in there. You're free to do it. And, and the rewards are commensurate. But the power of God to salvation is in the three. It's in the death. It's in the burial. It's in the rising to new life. must include death for sin through Christ, burial of the former woman or man, and resurrection of Christ in their lives to those who truly believe. Paul says a number of really interesting things relative to the resurrected Christ and believers. In Romans 5.10, he says, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Do you hear that? We were, when we were sinners, enemies, didn't believe, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. That's the world, you guys. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. See, saved by his life. That's the power of God to salvation, death, burial, and resurrection. That's the power of God to salvation. Reconciliation by death alone is not salvation. It's God not being angry with you. But as Paul said, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. He adds in 2 Corinthians, therefore, if any person is in Christ, she or he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. We, we say, oh, what happened to grandpa? Oh, he passed away, right? Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So old things are, have died, are buried, but all things have become new. That's a resurrected life. The new woman or man cannot remain dead in the grave to fully participate in the salvation and the power of the gospel in someone's life. They rise to new life through the power of his resurrection. Listen carefully to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.15. And since he died for all, they which live, See, do you see how for all, it's a, it's a certain thing. It's for all, his death. But Paul distinguishes by saying they who live, there's a difference. See, so his death, yeah, has a certain uh, application, good application for the world. But they which live, Paul says, should not henceforth live to themselves, but to him who died for them, and rose again. Uh, are you starting to see the picture? Let's break that down. It's really amazing. And since he died for all, Paul says, that's the first point of the good news. He died for all, all. And God was reconciling himself to the world through that death, period. Total reconciliation for the world. They which live, which differentiates the all from those who are believers. They who live, 
should not henceforth live unto themselves. That former man or woman is dead and buried, but should live unto him who died for them and rose again. Meaning the death and resurrection of Christ should have direct application and expression in their Christian life. And in all this, these three expressions, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, were able to actually see and understand how they together as the gospel are the power of God unto salvation. Another word for salvation is soteriology. There's all kinds of arguments, all kinds of arguments. But here, the gospel is called the power of God to salvation. And the gospel is his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Paul's teachings are those are to apply to others. It's the power of God to salvation. You see? Alone, they're not salvation. They can't operate alone in bringing forth salvation. His death alone only reconciles and removes the wrath abiding on humankind because the wages of sin is death. Burial only serves to cover or hide the former man or woman, the one from Adam and Eve, the fleshly monster that caused the sin. But the crowning glory of the power of the resurrection, prefaced by death and burial, brings all who believe into the will of God, which is to bring forth fruit by and through him and, and who are also saved to his kingdom. Everybody's been saved from hell and wrath, but only those who have fully embraced the power of God to salvation are saved to the kingdom. The external imagery found in water baptism reflects all this naturally. And so I find the expression really beautiful as people willingly submit to the public expression and admittance that they place their faith in Jesus, not only for dying and paying for the sins of the world, but who was also buried for, uh, in that death, in that body, and then rose to new life. And they're saying, I want this to apply to me now as well. And that caused Paul to write in Colossians, buried with him in baptism, wherein you also are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who has raised him from the dead. The final point, if you care, if you don't care, God loved you so much, he gave you his son. Live your life, die, whatever God's going to do with you, that it will be good for you, okay, for you. But if you care about being a son or daughter, about salvation in the fullest extreme, not just reconciliation, you die with Christ, you bury that fleshly self with Christ, and then you rise by the power of Christ and the power of his resurrection to new life. Out.